All right, well, let's come to the Word of God this morning, John chapter 19. We're still around the cross, but we will see our Savior this morning take the last breath in his body of mortal flesh, John chapter uh, 19. Finished out uh, last week on verse number 24, of course, where we looked at the soldiers and the things that the soldiers did as they were cast in lots for Christ's garments. We finished there. This morning, we're going to pick that up in verse number 25 to 30. Uh, verses 25 to 30, the title of this morning's uh, message is Mission Accomplished. Mission, God's mission, the only mission uh, that counts for anything in this world, the mission of God the Savior to take our place as our sinless substitute on the cross of Calvary, to bear God's wrath in our place, to pay our price for our sins, is mission accomplished this morning. Uh, John 19, verses 25 to 30. If you have your Bibles open, would you follow along with me, please, as I read from the Word of God. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, whom he loved. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. May God be pleased to bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning as we continue to gaze upon the scene at Calvary, the cross of Christ, his crucifixion, the work of God, the vicarious, substitutionary, sacrificial atonement of God, the price paid for our sins, completed. Calvary's cross, Golgotha, just outside the city walls of Jerusalem from 2,000 and odd years ago. Let's just bow our head and ask the Lord to meet with us this morning and praise him for the mission accomplished, but also for the mission that he has given to us. The work that Christ has finished is done. The work that we still have to do is still yet to be done. May the Lord help us with that. Father, we thank you as we come before your word this morning. We come in adoration and admiration of our Savior and the agony and the torture that he suffered before and during the cruel cross of Calvary. And Father, we see and are reminded anew again, afresh of the truth, that our Lord and Savior here on earth was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he bore our grief and he bore our sins. And we thank you, our God, this morning that that work of redemption that work of reconciliation between you and man was completed. It was finished. Nothing for us to add. Nothing for us to do to add to that work of redemption. But our Lord, you have given us some work to do. And our Father, as we gaze upon the Savior again this morning, may we be revived, refreshed, and renewed to the work that you've given us to do in this world. Our Father, may our affections be set on things above, not to make us useless in this world, but to make us useful in this world. May the uh, courageous, obedient work of our Savior drive us, spur us, and encourage us on to do and be more for the glory of Christ in this world and in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, what we find here at verse number 20, 25 is our biblical scene, our biblical portrait that's been painted for us here in John, uh, chapter 20, 20, uh, John chapter 19, verse 25. It makes an abrupt change here at verse number 25. If you will, we've got a, almost a transition here in the verse. You know, there now there stood by the cross of Jesus. 
and so on it goes. It's a stark contrast between all that has come before, what we've looked at in the preceding weeks, what we've read through in the preceding weeks, where we've looked at the, the callousness and contempt displayed by the, the Jewish religious leaders, the religious elite, callousness and contempt for Christ. By Pilate, the vacillating politician, at the end, a, a callousness and a contempt for the value of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The soldiers, finally, as we looked at last week, that cruelty, that callousness, that contempt for Christ and for the family and friends stood by the scene of death. We've seen that callousness, that contempt, that, that sinfulness of humanity all the way through the chapter. Now it switches. We move from callousness cruelty and contempt our scene switches at verse 25 it puts our focus back up on the savior back up on christ and his followers and his disciples and his mother and what do we see as the scene switches back to christ compassion care concern love isn't isn't that such a stark contrast as we go from the the worldly to the heavenly as we go from the sinful to the sinless, we see a complete change in the actions and the uh, abilities of our Savior and, of course, and his followers. You know, we're reminded uh, of John 13. Just turn there a moment. Keep your place in John 19. John 13 and verse 1, a wonderful verse we read so many, many, many months ago. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour, his hour of crucifixion, was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, look what it says, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And in a sense, that, that, that doesn't mean the end of Christ. Christ did not end, but his end here in human form, fully God, fully man, loved them unto the end. And this is what we're seeing in these verses before us this morning, before Christ has his last cry from the cross. Those of you familiar with that, Christ made seven cries from the cross of Calvary, this was the last and in many ways the most powerful, it is finished. But right up until that, he demonstrates his love for his own, his love for the disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's right, it's apt that there is a contrasting difference at verse 25. It's right when we go from the world to Christ, we see a difference. It's right when we go from the sinners to the followers of Christ, those still lost in sin and darkness, those that have come into the light of Christ, it's right that we see a difference here in the scripture because there really should be a difference. You know, we use the terminology, we're in the world but not of the world, and that is what is pictured here. Here at the foot of Calvary's cross are Christ's followers, some who love him, and they're in the world, they're in those events, they're, they're caught up with these events, but in the word of God and in action, they're actually separated from it. We, we're given a microcosm of everything else that's going on around, and here in the midst is Christ and his followers, and there's an absolute contrast between them. There should be a difference in us, friends. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're, we're in the midst of everything that is going on all around us all the time, but there should be a difference in Christians. Not only should there be a difference, we should want to make a difference. We should be difference makers. You know, that's that's important. And I think that's what we see something here in the scriptures this morning. Mission accomplished, but from this verses before us, uh, there are many areas we could go, but three, three areas I'd like to just pull out this morning from the message. The first is that the true Mary stood out. The true Mary, and by that I'm talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course, more than one Mary at the foot of the cross. But the true Mary, Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, in verses 25 to 27, is standing out. Look here at verse number 25. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. That's Mary. He'd been married to Joseph, okay? Joseph had been Christ's stepfather. Now, we assume and intimate from the text that in the three and a half years of Christ's adult ministry, at some point there or some point leading up to that, Joseph has passed away. Joseph has died. You say, where do you get that from, Pastor? Because, because he's committing Mary to the care of John, not to the care of Joseph, her husband. He obviously is no longer, no longer around. But they stood, uh, Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, 
uh, a little bit of Bible study. We, we think that's probably Salome, the, uh, the mother of uh, James and John, possibly, but not definitely. And, uh, and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, out of whom have been cast seven devils. We're not going to pick up on every character there around the cross. You can pick up any good Bible-believing commentary if you want some more. But I want to single out for a moment here Mary, the mother who birthed Christ after, of course, the Holy Ghost had come upon her, and uh, the virgin birth, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to just take a few moments and focus in on Mary because it's very, very important. Now, firstly, we've enjoyed as we've been going through just picking out some of the prophecies that have been fulfilled. Yet again, I, you know, I can't put too much emphasis on the prophecies fulfilled and how important they are as they separate out the Holy Bible from any other so-called holy book. You know, they, they, they may make predictions that never come true, but the Bible is prophetical and it pinpoints accurately prophecies that were fulfilled and many of them at the crucifixion. But here in relation to Mary herself, we find a New Testament prophecy fulfilled. Just turn back with me, if you would, to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2. And you'll remember following the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in fulfillment with the law, um, Christ was taken up to the temple in Luke chapter 2. And uh, the offering was made, the sacrifice, according to the law, the pair of the turtle doves and two young pigeons. And uh, if we pick it up at Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, do note the terminology there, the Lord's Christ. The Bible tells us there will be other Christs, but there is only one Christ that is the Lord's Christ. There are many antichrists. There will be one antichrist, the main antichrist, but there is the Lord's Christ. There are more than one Christ in that sense, and more so, of course, as we see the day approaching. Verse 27, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, you know, Christ fulfilled the law and kept the law in perfection, even from his very birth. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Salvation is of the what? Jews. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now look here in verse 35 when he makes a prophetical utterance. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Here at the cross in John chapter 19, that prophecy of Simeon, those words given by God to Simeon for Mary are coming true. As she watches her son of her flesh, fully God, fully man, son of God, God the son, crucified in agony and pain. Can you imagine as a mother, how would that feel? It would feel that the sword was piercing her heart. I'm sure if she could, she would have died in this place like any mother, I'm sure, would. So we find once again the, uh, the, the, the prophecies around Christ on the cross continuing to come true with utter accuracy. But the reason I'm saying the true Mary stood out this morning, because we have a problem with Mary today. We've had a problem with Mary for, uh, you know, a good almost a couple of thousand years, 1,500 years at least. And that's there's a, a new Mary that was invented not the Mary of the Bible. And that's the Mary of Roman Catholicism. That's the Mary that is put forward as a, a co-mediator, a co-mediatrix, if you will, a kind of a pseudo-second saviour-ish. You know, some, some of the Catholic painted, you know, Mary's almost put above Christ. You know, you, you'll find Mary on the mantelpiece. Mary can be prayed to. But is that the Mary of the Bible? We must ask ourselves because 
you know, it, it could be it could be rightly said that surely if we're if we're going to talk about the Royal Mary and we're going to denounce the Mary of Roman Catholicism, we must be careful not to not to you know bash other religions and other thoughts. Surely, if they you know they've got the right view of Mary, then we shouldn't undermine that view. The question we have to ask ourselves is where do we get our view of Mary from? Where do we get our truth of Mary from? From the Bible, from the Word of God. And uh, as I was saying to, uh, to Michelle this morning, what we have to be careful of is we don't put more emphasis on something than the Bible does. And usually when you find people astray in doctrine, it's because they've taken an emphasis and put more emphasis on it than God does and made it a primary feature when it's not a primary feature and built a theology around it. That's what we have with the Mary of Roman Catholicism. She's become almost a demigod, something to be worshipped, someone to be prayed to, someone who's almost co-equal with Jesus. And, of course, all the immaculate assumption uh, and, you know, Roman Catholic doctrine and dogma, you can look at that. We're not going to go through it all, list it all this morning. But I want to say this to you. It's, and it's not about bashing Roman Catholics, okay? Roman Catholicism is a wicked, satanic, Babylonian corruption of the truth that will lead you straight to the devil's hell quick as a flash. And that's the truth. But that doesn't mean we're against people who are in error in this tradition. They're like any other unsaved person. Christ died for them. We want to see them saved. And I know many Roman Catholic people that would make wonderful Christians if they were to be saved. They're, they're very moral. You know, they've got some wonderful, wonderful attributes and characters. Many of them love God, they just don't know the God that they love. And so this isn't about denouncing Roman Catholics. Let me say this again, because when we get to these points in time, it's very important. In the same way, we don't denounce Muslims, we denounce Islam as a false religion. We don't denounce Buddhists, we denounce Buddhism. And there's a difference between the two. But of course, with all false religions, the upshot of it is the result of that religion. Many naive, traditional and superstitious people follow those religions all the way to hell, believing they've been enlightened. So we must. We must. It says Jesus, his mother, was standing by the cross. That's Mary. We need the true Mary to stand out. The Mary of Roman Catholicism is the Mary of Roman Catholic creation, not the Mary of biblical truth and biblical origin. And we find this, you know, now as they stood by the cross, Jesus, his mother, uh, and we see Mary in all her humanity. And that's so important. And, and again, just go back to Luke chapter one. The Bible shows us nothing other than Mary's humanity. She was flesh. She was a sinner, just like you and I. But she was highly favored, surely a virtuous woman, yes. Highly favored by God? Yes, the scriptures tell us so. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. She was a woman among women. And as a woman among women, she walked in sinful flesh. She had no deity. She was not an angel, a higher creation than man. She was fully a woman, descendant of Adam and Eve, upon whom sin and death had passed, but among women of flesh highly favored. Just the same way John the Baptist, born of a woman, greatly spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ, but flesh and bone and blood and sin. Same with Mary. Flesh and bone and blood and sin, but highly favored. The Bible nowhere speaks of anything about Mary other than, their, than her humanity, her humanness. She was completely human. She has a lineage listed in Matthew and Luke. Her descendants are given. She didn't come from heaven. She's not a special creation. There is no touch of godness in her and never was created to have a touch and never assumed any touch of godness other than that that you and I would get through salvation from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ 
as saviour. You see, we find that not only did Mary have her humanity 100%, she also had humility before the Lord. John chapter 2, a uh, long, long time since we've been there, you know, the first miracle that Lord Jesus uh, performed in Cana of Galilee, and you'll remember the part that Mary played in that. John chapter 2, uh, well, we'll read verse 1 to 5, actually, John chapter 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, let me just say this. The Bible calls Mary the mother of Jesus, but Jesus nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus nowhere calls her mother. Nowhere. She is listed as the mother of Jesus, but Jesus nowhere, not one time, refers to her as mother. That's important. That's important. She was the vehicle that God used. God the Father to bring God the Son into the earth in human form when he humbled himself and stepped down from the Son in heaven. That's important. And both, verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. That's a rebuke. In anybody's book, that's a rebuke. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. We see her fully in her humanity and fully in her humility, fully in submission to the Son. Now, that's an important statement she makes. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And Jesus told us not to pray as the heathens do and the pagans do, not to follow that paganistic adoption of prayer, praying to idols and artifacts and bones and relic. Jesus has already told us not to do that, yet the Roman Catholic Church turned Mary and the babe, notice Christ is always the babe, which is a Babylonian image of mother and child. It started in Babylon, of course Roman Catholicism is mystery Babylon. Jesus Christ said we must never pray to those kind of images. We are to, to, to honor God and pray to none but God the Father, our Father, which art in heaven. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to Mary. We don't need any age to prayer. That's a, that's a euphemism for idols in the Roman Catholic Church, by the way. That's all that is. They know they can't call them idols, so they call them age to prayer. The only aid we need to prayer is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, the Scriptures tell us. And if you're saved, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. So we find that Mary's humility before Christ stems from her humanity. She's not alongside him saying, well, hang on a minute, son. You know, I'm your co-mediatrix. You know, I sit alongside you on the throne of heaven. Let's not forget that. I know we're here on earth and I birthed you, but when we get back up there, no, no, no. That's nonsense. It's mythology. It's superstition. And it is tradition. Just turn with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. Now, this is the very, very last mention of Mary in the Bible. And so at the very least, you would expect all through the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see nothing of Mary other than the fact she's a woman, a woman of flesh. Now, you would think if we were being led by uh, the word of God, by God himself, to, to see something future for Mary, you know, I am going to assume Mary to heaven. Mary will have an assumed position <clears throat> next to the sun, got her own throne with a little crown of stars and a halo. And, you know, you can come to Jesus through Mary. You can't have a direct route. Then we would expect to see some prophetical allusion to that in the word of God, especially at the very last mention. But what do we see? Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. This is in the upper room. And supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The last mention in the Bible of Mary gives no special recognition, gives no prophetic recognition other than that she still continued to be the mother of Jesus. She was the mother of Jesus, a woman highly favored among women a virtuous woman in many senses, no doubt, but she was not, 
is not, nor ever will be, the mother of God. She is the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God. He already was God before he was birthed, and he had no mother as God. God is. In the beginning was the word. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ in eternity past. In the beginning, John 1, 1, was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And these are important semantics. You, you, you get your Holy Mary, Mother of God. That's how your Roman Catholic will start with a little, you know, prayer will, rosary bead, uh, paganistic nonsense. Holy Mary, Mother of God. No. Mother of Jesus, yes, he already was God. Do you see the difference? So Mary was not the Mother of God. And she certainly has not become, never was, or ever will be some kind of demigod, praying mediatrix, co-redemptress with the Lord Jesus Christ. He did the work on the cross of redeeming mankind. He said it is finished. He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He is our high priest. He is our savior. And no one comes in between us and God himself, not even Mary, wonderful as she is, to make her into something other than that which she is by the word of God requires superstition, ignorance, tradition, and myth. Let the true Mary stand out by the cross, the mother of Jesus. Back to John 19, please, if you. Not only do we see that the true Mary stood out, we find also if we bring our attention down to verses 26 and 27, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, there it is again, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. We see the true Mary standing out, but we also see the true disciple standing by. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And again, not to repeat and reread the verses Tam, Sam took us through not so long ago. We know that is John's assignation to himself in his own gospel. He is identified as the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who laid upon Christ's breast at the Last Supper. Uh, you'll find that assignation in chapter 13 and verse 23, chapter 20 and verse 2, chapter 21, verse 7 and 20, and, of course, where we are in our text right now. The true disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, remember, they'd all scattered. They'd all run in the garden, including John. But he had come back, he'd gone into the palace, he'd gone through the trial, he followed Christ. And here was John with a faithful collection of women. Uh, what a ratio. I think there were four women at the foot of the cross and one man. Hasn't that marked out the pattern for a lot of Christianity over the years? A lot of faithful women, a lot of, a lot of weak men who can't be bothered to be faithful enough to be Christians. Too tough for them. They can't hack the ridicule. They can't take it following God. They can't come into submission. And set the pattern at the foot of the cross. Thank God for faithful Christian men, but thank God for faithful praying Christian women. The church would be undone without them. I tell you that. Over the ages, that has always been the case. But the true disciple stood by. Isn't that wonderful to see? Then saith he to the disciple. He was standing by. So close by that he was witnessing this horror firsthand and conversing with Christ on the cross, listening to his words, listening to his commands, listening to the very, very last, to the words of the living God and hanging on his every word. And I think we'll find that as a truth today in the Christian church. Some of the followers, some of the Christians, some of the disciples of Christ are standing by close to the Lord close to his word, close to his every command, visible, assembled, useful, there, in place, where they need to be, when they need to be there, hanging on the very words of God. But some are standing a little bit too far off to hear what he says. Go with me back to Luke chapter 23, because we're going to find those at the foot of the cross are not the only followers of Christ who are present. Some are just a bit of a way out, that you've got to walk to find them. Luke 23 and verse number 49, of course, these are the parallel accounts. 
But in Luke 20, 23, and uh, well, let's start at verse 48, Luke 23, 48. And all the people that came together to that site, and this is talking about the crucifixion, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. The true disciples, the true followers stood by, close by, close enough to hear the word of God, close enough to see the very God of salvation. But there's a great truth. There are many who are Christians, undoubtedly, many who are followers of Christ, but they're always a bit far off. You've got to go a bit further to find them, to fetch them, to inform them, to tell them what God said, because they're not close enough to the Christ of the cross. They're not close enough to the words of God to hear them themselves. They're always on the fringe, far enough away that they've got to hear it from somebody else. In a sense, don't we find there are a number of Christians that we don't find in the local church where they should be and where they need to be? Oh, I'm following Christ my own way. No, you're standing too far off. Oh, well, you know, I, I've got my own views on Jesus. No, you need to hear his words. Now, when you remember this, his words didn't end at the Gospel of John. Christ's words, and this is why sometimes I caution people about Bibles that have the words of Christ in red. You've seen those Bibles, you know, and they say on the spot, words of Christ in red. And sometimes that, well, that's a good idea, because I can flick through and I'll find out where Jesus spoke. Now, where do you find those words of red? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to tell you, Jesus was speaking in the book of Acts, the book of Romans, Corinthians, first and second, because the apostle Paul had revelations directly to him from the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know why some people get messed up with the doctrine in the Bible? Because they think Christ was only speaking where he's in red in the Bible. So when well, Jesus said this, well, I'm going to do this. Well, let me tell you, if you do that, you're going to end up in hell. Because Jesus carried on speaking, because until he died on the cross, we didn't even get into the New Testament. It started with Christ's death on the cross at Calvary. And some people get really led astray because, oh, I focus on the words of Jesus. Well, Jesus spoke in the book of Ephesians, but it's not in red. So I caution you, be careful if you've got one of those Bibles with the words of Christ in red, because you're missing uh, the most important stuff for the church age that Jesus spoke, because that came after the end of John's gospel, the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. The true disciple was standing close by. This is it. Uh, if we do go to the words of Christ in red, if you've got them, you go to John chapter 15. And the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, he outlined in John chapter 15 how important it was. He placed a great emphasis on those who remain in his love. You know, if you love me, obey my commandments, obey my word, follow me. That's what he kept saying in John chapter 15. He said those that demonstrate their love for him are those that keep his commandments. Can you know his commandments if you're far off? Can you know them if you're too far away? If you're far off from the word of God, the Holy Bible, if you're far off from the local church, if you're far off from everything that God has put into place in the New Testament so that we can hear, observe, understand, be encouraged, exampled, and exhorted by the words of God, the commands of Christ, and you'll find those commands in Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians as well, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but too far off, too far off. We see so much of it today. People too far away from Christ who are naming the name of Christ, too far away from the church, which he died for, a church without spot and without wrinkle as the, the desire. What do we see about the true disciple who stood by? Faithfulness. John was faithful. I think John kept this vision. He was close up to the cross. Were, 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 were all the disciples faithful? Yes. Did Christ bring them all back? Did they all see the risen Christ and become the sent apostles? Yes, they did, of course. And Paul, being the last one born out of due time, saw the risen Christ and was commissioned by the risen Christ. But I think John kept this image of the closeness of Christ on the cross in his mind because John lived faithful. But you know what John speaks of so much? Love. You read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Love and truth, love and truth, love and truth. And you know why I think John put such an emphasis on love and truth? Because that's what he saw close up in the cross in Calvary. Love and truth hanging on that cross. And I think that image, that stayed with him. And regardless of the fact when he was, uh, you know, uh, 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 what's the word, isolated on the island of Patmos and all the rest of it, 
John, and John was given the revelation of the end times, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation. Great emphasis because of his faithfulness. Why? The Bible says that he was standing by. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by. What does that mean? Alongside, present, close to, available, visible. Can I ask you this morning, I'm sure you probably all come across some people who are Christians, but they're not always standing by, are they? They're not always close by. They're not always available. They're not always visible. Saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saved by grace through faith, but not standing by. You've got to go and look for them to find them. You've got to go and fetch them. You've got to molly coddle them. You've got to keep constantly, you know, stroking their tummy and tickling them under the, oh, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, we love you, we miss you. But the true disciples of Christ, come blood, snot, and gore, are standing by, in place, on time, every time, all the time, ready to hear from God, ready to hear his commands. You know, it's, it's a sad thing when, when Christians don't go from babes to mature Christians in Christ. We've got a lot of Christian babies in nappies in our country today who constantly need feeding, changing, wiping, burping. We need some mature Christians today who, despite it all, will be found stood by, stood ready, ready to be commanded by Christ and act upon his Commands. We need some more mature Christians in the world today. The true disciples stood by and he was seen by faithfulness. And secondly, he was seen by willingness. Look what Jesus said to him. Well, first of all, he said, uh, woman, behold thy son. He said to his mother, Mary, behold thy son. And he wasn't saying, look at me. He was pointing somehow, some way, spiritually, metaphorically with his eyes to John, the disciple. Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his home. He was not only full of faithfulness, he was full of willingness. What Jesus said, John did. And John did it willingly. John did it obediently. And John did it immediately. Isn't that incredible? Let me ask you something. Look up here a minute, Christian, and I'm, I'm going to join you in this. What would our Christian lives, each and every one of us, what would our Christian lives be like if every one of us took God's commands to us, New Testament church Christians, and we did them willingly, obediently, and immediately? Would your Christian life look any different to how it does this morning? I know mine would. I know mine would. You see, we do Christ's commands semi-willingly, semi-obediently, and conveniently, don't we? Now you think about this. Christ just said to John, who got his own family, his own business, and everything else, he said, take this woman who is not your flesh and blood. She's not even your mother. I mean, you know her. She's one of the crowd. She's one of us, one of the church. And bring her into your house. Take this widow and look after her until the day she dies. Now, don't miss this. Didn't she have other children? We know that the Lord Jesus Christ had half-brothers and sisters. The Bible tells us so. Wouldn't, wouldn't the expectation be that they should have looked after her? Jesus set an important principle there. God's people need to look after God's people. But can you imagine that? I mean, as many of you know, I live with my mother. My mother lives with us in the family and home. And, 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 and I'm her flesh and blood son, and she's my flesh and blood mother. But let me tell you, that's difficult sometimes. And we're flesh and blood. Can you imagine having a cantankerous old lady who's not your flesh and blood who you've got to take in? I can't think of anything worse. You met some of those old women, men, they never stop moaning. Nothing's ever right, nothing's ever good enough. And Jesus says, you take her and take her into your house. John, John never said, well, you know, she's not my responsibility. You've got, oh, she's got other children. Let them take care of her. He did it obediently, willingly, and immediately. What? A thing. So what's that? It's a true disciple. Not questioning the word of God. Not questioning God's command. Just carrying the out. He was willing to play his part even when he didn't know the plan. You know, he's not stood at the foot of Christ going, well, fair enough, Jesus, but how long for? Um, 
How many meals have I got to give her? What's the outcome? When's somebody going to take her off my hands? Is that for this week? Is it for this month? Is it for a year? He played his part. He didn't know the plan. Wouldn't it make a difference if Christians up and down this nation just played their part and did what the Lord called us to do and spent less time whinging, whining, moaning and complaining and more time just doing what Jesus Christ called us to do. And, hey, I'm preaching to me as well in this, by the way, not just you. What a difference. If we reacted like John did to the word of God, wouldn't that make a difference? I think it would not only make a difference in our own life, I think it would make a difference in this church, it would make a difference in the city of Exeter and up and down the land if, if Christians just did what we're supposed to do. I think it would make a massive difference in our nation. Christ would be magnified and Christ would be glorified. True Mary stood out. The true disciple stood by. And lastly this morning, the true saviour stepped beyond. Verses 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, mission accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and so this isn't the wine that he refused earlier. No alcohol, no drugs were going in the Savior's mouth. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, in mean, a big stick and a spear, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Accomplished. All things are now accomplished. And even at the very end, as Christ is on the cross, bleeding and dying for the sins of the world to be the savior of the world, he's issuing words of compassion and care. He's caring for his own, right? The good shepherd and his sheep. He knows his sheep. He loves his sheep. He cares for his sheep. His situation and his circumstance on the cross didn't make any difference to that. He didn't resort to callousness, cruelty, and cynicism. Well, this has been a fine, fine old time, isn't it? Look where it's got me. Come in here for you people. No, no. No. Christ nailed to the cross, crucified scourge with a crown of thorns, blood dripping down his face. In agony, still looks upon his own care, compassion, concern. But even so, in the midst of all that, to fulfill the prophecies of the word of God, look what it says. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That's how important the word of God is. You know, Psalm 138, verse 2, his word is magnified above his own name. The word of God is really important to God. And that the scripture might be fulfilled, if you will, there's Christ on the cross, care, compassion, getting things in order to the very last. And he said, oh, and by the way, there's one more prophecy, one more prophecy from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, one more thing to fulfill this last one, that the scripture might be fulfilled, and Christ said what? I thirst. Do you think he needed a drink? He knew where he was going. He wasn't looking to prolong his life. Do you think he needed a drink? Oh, a little bit longer if I have a drink. That the scripture might be fulfilled. The word of God is so important to God. How important is it to you and I? I think many, many Christians, many, many Christians don't put enough emphasis on the word of God. Psalm 69, verse number 21. Psalm 69, verse number 21. This is the, the scripture, the prophecy to which Jesus Christ referred that needed to be fulfilled on the cross of Calvary. Psalm 69, verse number 21. <clears throat> we won't take the time to read a number of the verses. You can read them in your own context if you'd like to. A lot of it is tribulational. It is a psalm of David, a type of Christ. <clears throat> well, let's read verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I look for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. 
Now, verse number 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me, what does that say next? Vinegar to drink. Christ said, I thirst. What did they give him to drink? Vinegar. Tiny, seemingly insignificant detail, yet that's how important the details of God's word are to God. Hang in there in agony. Hang in there bearing the sins of you and I, the wrath of our holy God for three hours. The earth darkened, the earth trembled, and yet, if you will, in a kind of parenthesis way, he went, there's one more thing that's really important. It said this in Psalm 69, 21. Now I must fulfill this so that you down the centuries can go, wow, the word of God is perfect and powerful and prophetical, and it all adds up. I thirst. All things were now accomplished. Can I say this? Jesus Christ didn't just come to teach us something. He came to do something. You know, Acts chapter to 1 and verse 1, uh, when, uh, when the doctor, Luke, the physician, is outlining the history uh, and kind, kind of give a part, he said, the things that Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach. There's another thing that saddens me. We've got a lot of, a lot of Christians who want to teach everybody everything and do nothing. God wasn't looking for a bunch of theologians sitting around in his church, you know, comparing notes and telling each and every one why, you know, their new theory is better than that theory. Sat in prophecy conferences, left, right and center all their life. Those things are important. Yes, they are. But the things Jesus Christ spoke began to do and to teach. He didn't just come. Was teaching important? Yes. Was teaching the truth important? Yes. It was a primary part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring truth, grace and truth into the world. But he both began to do and to teach. Christianity must have action. Christians must have some action in their Christian life. They must be ready to work. All things were now accomplished. Can I ask you this morning, do you have a yearning to accomplish something? Do you want to actually do something while you're here on earth? Do you want to actually do something for God? Do you want to actually achieve something for God? Do you want to get something done? Because when you go to heaven... It's all taken care of. It's only now that we can accomplish something worth any eternal value. You know, so often, so many Christians are too busy with their own little pet things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. The Lord gave the local church. And through the local church, there is you won't find a ministry in the Bible that's not under the local church. And there's all people set up all kinds of ministries, but when they're not under the authority, of the local church, I'll tell you what, they're not biblical. So, well, they're very useful. I don't care. They're not biblical. And I have no time for unbiblical Christians. This is a Bible-believing church. You want to be an unbiblical Christian, then go somewhere with your parachurch ministries and go and sit out there with your parachurch friends and go and be the non-Bible church. But in the church, we direct our efforts, our time and our talent and our treasures and all that the Lord has given us to accomplish something in and through the local church for the glory of God, for the, the great commission of the gospel. Do you have a yearning to accomplish something, to have a part, just to play a part in accomplishing something? Do you have that? Because Christ said all things will now accomplished his mission his purpose his plan god's plan was accomplished at calvary but he's given us a mission right mark 16 15 go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of sons to come under the word of god profitable for doctrine to you know that the, the man of god may be perfect god has given us many things to accomplish in this earth, on this world, during the time that we live and draw breath. Do you have that yearning? Because Christ had a yearning, humbled himself, became obedient even unto death, death of the cross. Can we humble ourselves? Can we become obedient? Can we get a mission accomplished? Can we, can we have a desire and a yearning to play our part in God's plan? 
the true saviour stepped beyond. The work was accomplished, but lastly, the work was finished. Finished. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he had therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Absolutely finished. Not part finished. The work of redemption, the work of reconciliation, bringing lost, sinful man back into a relationship with God. That work was finished and then available to all mankind. The work required to pay the price for the sin of mankind was finished completely. You know, some of you know I've been working the last couple of weeks on trying to get a, a bathroom sorted and you know, get some access from the mother, make it a bit easier and all the rest of it. And um, it's not yet finished. Um, but when it is finished, it will still be imperfect. And when even when it's finished, I'll still go in and think it just needs this, you know, this little addition here. It just needs this little trim there. It still needs something. And even when I look and go, it's finished, do you know what? It will still be imperfect because there are mistakes in it. Not so with Christ. He didn't say it is finished, but I need you to add some little trim to finish it off, you know, down through the church age. I need you to add some water. I need you to add some wafers. You know, add those, and that will finish it off a little bit. I need you to add um, a human priest as an intercessor. Do that. That will finish it. No, it is finished. Nothing to add, nothing to take away. Finished. Redemption requires no zero, nil, zip, nada, Finishing touches. No matter what your Catholic priest, no matter what the Pope says, no matter what the Prophet Muhammad says, no matter what uh, you know the Jews continue to say, or anybody else, the secularists, the humanists, or anybody else, it is finished completely. All we have to do, receive it. That's it. Believe and receive by grace through faith. So from unbelief to belief. And receive the finished work of Christ. And let me say this as well that stays finished. You can't lose your salvation. You can't lose the Holy Ghost. You can't lose anything that God gave you. It is all complete, sealed, secure until the day of our redemption. It's finished. Do you know what else was finished? The Old Testament. Here in this verse, that is where. The New Testament starts. Hebrews 9. You see, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament portion of your Bible, but most of them and most of the chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not in the New Testament. That messes up so many people. Everyone who's got wrong doctrine that I know is because they don't understand where the New Testament starts. It just started when Christ said, it is finished. That is the start of the New Testament. Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of the chapters are in the Old Testament dispensation. So how do you know that? Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, the word of God confirms the word of God. Verses 14 to 17. How much more shall the blood of Christ, where was that shed on the cross of Calvary? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Mark it down, underline it. He is the mediator of the New Testament. When did it start? That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, you understand Christ had to die for all the Old Testament saints before the law and under the law. To receive that full remission of sins, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why they were in Abraham's bosom, the paradise of God, waiting for that redemption. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that's the old, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force 
after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Can we all agree this is really simple? The New Testament started with the death of Christ on the cross. So, yeah, well, that's straightforward. Let me tell you this. When then did the New Testament church come into force? Before or after the death of Christ on the cross? I don't see how you can have a New Testament church before you have a New Testament. And that's where some people get really messed up. The church is called the church, the New Testament church that Christ purchased with his blood. There is no New Testament church before the New Testament. There is a Jewish church with Jewish disciples preaching a Jewish gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the gospel of the kingdom. It is a transitional Old Testament church and gospel that then becomes the New Testament church when the New Testament starts and is fully, fully prepared on the day of Pentecost with the giving of the Holy Spirit of God and the, the body of Christ. Is and it really is so simple, but you'd be amazed at how many people can't understand the Bible. And they take a load of stuff from a church that's not the New Testament church and try and plonk it alongside the cross. They'll mess you up completely. What happened? The true Savior stepped beyond. Did Christ die? No, his body died. His body went in the tomb. His soul went down to take the keys of hell and death into the paradise of God and preach the gospel to those in chains. And by 6 p.m., Christ's soul, his bodily shaped soul, was in the paradise of God with the thief on the cross who had promised that before 6 p.m. because that very day, that very day, he was going to be in paradise with Christ. Christ commended his spirit to the Father, his body to the tomb, and the soul to go and do the work down below. Only Christ's body breathed its last breath. Christ has not. He's risen. He's alive evermore. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. We serve a living, risen Savior. He's in the world today. That Spirit of Christ is in us. Holy Ghost, Spirit of Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, fully indwell every believer. So for Christ, mission accomplished. For us, we're still on our mission, but he sent us on. The question is, do you want to accomplish something in that mission, in the work, will, and way that God has called us to do it? I hope you do. May the Lord help us to do that. May we indeed be the true disciples standing by as John was. May the Lord help us that we, we get the shout and go into his presence, that we can go before the judgment seat of Christ with mission accomplished. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word of truth, Lord. Thank you for showing us how to unlock the word of truth. Now, Father, we thank you that you're not the author of confusion. We thank you, Father, that we're not confused about the true Mary. We thank you, Father, that we're not confused about what it is to be a true disciple. We may not make the grade many times, but we're not confused about it. And our Lord, we thank you for this. We're not confused about the true Savior, Christ alone. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to you but through the true Savior. No goodwill or good works is going to cut it. No religion of man is going to cut it. Christ alone and that precious blood which cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. Lord, in the precious blood of Christ, we come before you this morning. And we ask, Lord, for those of us who are saved, who know Christ, who are Christians, dear Lord God, help us to get on mission and get the mission accomplished. Help us not just to understand the purpose, but the plan that you've given to do that. Father, if there be any among us that are not truly saved, don't know Christ as their Savior, haven't received him as their Savior, then this, this very day, our Father, whether by presence or live stream, Lord, then bring them to the Christ of Calvary. May they see the true Savior 
and receive Christ today. Believe and receive him today. Sins forgiven and forgotten. Cleansed and kept for all eternity. Father, I pray souls will be saved today. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for your goodness and grace. Help us, oh God, to get our mission accomplished. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.